Good morning, brethren and sisters. It's nice uh, to be with you this morning. Muriel and I are here at uh, Sandy Lake near Peterborough. And uh, it's great to be able to come together with brethren and sisters far and wide to uh, remember our Lord, to think about our commitment to the truth and to each other and to talk about the hope that we have in unity to get together. So we have brethren and sisters from various parts of the, of the country of indeed the world. And it's nice to be here together. As I've already said, we would like to uh, bow our heads in prayer now, as we think about, uh, our relationship with uh, our Father through his Son, our Lord Jesus. So please bow your heads with me. 
Father in heaven, we come before thy throne of grace this morning in Jesus' name, expressing gratitude for our calling to thank you for the covenant relationship established through the patriarchs of old, that covenant that binds us together through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we come to thee now uh, humbly with a degree of reverence, which we pray will uh, find your blessing. We come to thee with minds tuned to the hope that we have of Jesus coming soon, minds trying to develop a faith that will commit us to being found acceptable before our Lord when he comes, which we pray will be soon. And as we witness the signs of the times in the nations, even the signs of the times in the brotherhood, we ask for your blessing and guidance and care this day, our Heavenly Father, as we convene to take bread and wine in memory of the life that Jesus lived and the death that he went through in the resurrection. We appreciate the brotherhood. We appreciate the binding power of your word of truth in our lives that keeps us together, that helps us to try and think uh, in, in like manner as those around us uh, in the truth. And as we come to thee now this morning, we seek your blessing on our brother Alan as he exhorts us, brothers and sisters that are going through difficult times in their lives. And we appreciate uh, the hope that we have. We are grateful, Father, for your continued care. And we would pray now for our brother Paul Pierce, who is in uh, a coma in a hospital in Toronto, and ask for your healing to be with him, and especially those that are looking after him and the extended family. Your guiding hand to be with Dan Wilt and others who are going through difficult circumstances in the falling asleep of Sister Linda. And we seek blessing, Father, with brethren and sisters uh, in various parts of the country that are going through times of concern and anxiety, uh, not just for the uh, COVID-19 that's going on, but just the daily run, run of the mill activities that we are subject to as mortal creatures. And so we appreciate, Father, your care in our lives and uh, seek guidance and counsel. We realize we must rely on your word of truth and the hope that we have. We realize that we, as we consider your word of truth this morning uh, with Brother Allen, that that would help us to, to see a better way in life and keep the vision of the kingdom before us and keep the hope alive in our, in our lives and our faith continuing to develop as we await your son's return. So we ask for your blessing now and seek your guiding hand in what we do before thee. Your care with those that are going through uh, times of, of anxiety, as we've already mentioned, that uh, there are things uh, developing in the world that we don't know of, but that you do. And we realize our Heavenly Father, you are in control and pray earnestly for your kingdom to come and your will to be done soon with Jesus being here. And we ask for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've... Uh, Nice to have Brother Alan uh, Marquith with us. I'm assuming uh, Nancy's with him as well. Uh, in any event, uh, uh, Alan has asked that uh, we read together from Jeremiah chapter 26. And uh, I've asked Brother Percy William if he would read that uh, Jeremiah 26 with us, uh, for us uh, this morning. So Percy. Reading from the New King James Version. Jeremiah chapter 26. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, Je the son of Josiah, king of Judah, the word came from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak to all the cities of Judah, which come to worship in the Lord's house, all the words that I command you to speak to them. 
do not diminish a word. Perhaps everyone will listen and turn their evil way that I may relent concerning the calamity which I propose to bring on them because of the evil of their doings. And you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, if you will not listen to me to walk in my law, which I have set before you, to heed the words of my servants and the prophets, whom I sent to you, both rising up early and sending them, but not, but you have not heeded, then I will make this house like Shiloh, and will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. So the priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. Now it happened that Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people, that the priests and the prophets and all the people seized him, saying, You will surely die. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, this and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant? And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the princes of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord and sat down in the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. And the priests and the prophets spoke to the princes and all the people, saying, This man deserves to die, for he has prophesied against this city, as you have heard with your ears. Then Jeremiah spoke to all the princes and all the people, saying, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city with all the words that you have heard. Now, therefore, amend your ways and your doings, and obey the voice of the Lord your God. Then the Lord will resent, relent concerning the doom that he has pronounced against you. As for you, here I am in your hand. Do with me as seems good and proper to you. But know for certain that if you put me to death, you will surely bring innocent blood on yourselves, on this city, on its inhabitants, for truly the Lord has sent me to you to speak all these words in your hearing. So the princes and all the people said to the priests and the prophets, This man does not deserve to die, for he has spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God. Then certain of the elders of the land rose up and spoke to all the assembly of people, saying, Micah of Mursheth prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and spoke to all the people of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Zion shall be plowed like a field, Jerusalem shall be heaps of ruin, and the mountain of the temple like the bare hills of the forest. Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Judah ever put him to death? Did he not hear the Lord and seek the Lord's favor? Now the Lord relented concerning the doom which he had pronounced against them, but what we are doing great evil against ourselves. Now there was a certain man who prophesied in the name of the Lord, Uriah, the son of Shimei, of Kirjath and Jeremith, who prophesied against this city and against the land according to the words of Jeremiah. And Jehoiakim the king, which all his, with all his mighty men and all the princes, heard these words. His words, the king sought to put him to death, but Uriah heard it, and he was afraid and fled and went to Egypt. Then Jehoiakim the king sent men to Egypt. El Nathan the son of Achor, and the other men who went with him to Egypt. And they brought Uriah from Egypt and brought him to the Jehoiakim the king, who killed him with the sword and cast his body into the graves of the common people. Nevertheless, the hand of Achim the son of Saphon was with Jeremiah so that they should not give him into the hands of the people to be put to death. Thanks for that uh, reading, Perth. Um, Brother Allen, uh, is here to exhort us and we'd like uh, Alan to uh, carry on right now. Thank you. Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. It's, uh, it's really a 
pleasure and a privilege to, to be with you even in this way. When I saw the platform at the opening there, it was just that desire to, to be there physically with you. But uh, this, this will suffice for now. It's, it's good to see the uh, familiar faces and, and some not so familiar these days. Um, Sister Nancy actually isn't with me. She's in Brampton uh, helping out uh, my son and daughter-in-law with their, their children. So I'm assuming she's part of the Brampton uh, meeting this morning, but I bring her love and I bring the love of your brothers and sisters uh, from Greenaway. And uh, they, um, they started earlier at 10 o'clock, um, but I wasn't able to get that. I was just kind of going over some things for today and looking at it. Um, I, I think you're probably wondering, you know, why would he, why would Brother Allen have Jeremiah 26 read, you know, um, as an exhortation? You, you might be thinking that when you think about the words, if we were paying close attention to the um, uh, downer kind of message it sounded like. But just think back a little bit to the book of Jeremiah. You know, when we, just a few short days, weeks ago, we were in the book of Jeremiah in our readings. And I think it is exhortation because I put a, a title to this talk actually, and it's called Another Part of Love. That hymn from the uh, Praise the, to the Lord, Praise the Lord book, Brother, Sister, Let Me Serve You. This is an aspect of service. I don't know any one of us that would have, would raise our hand, I know I wouldn't, to be a prophet in the days of the prophets. When you read what we just read, it, it really wasn't a pleasurable experience. Um, on the surface, the book of Jeremiah appears to be fairly depressing. It comes across because we tend to focus on the rejection of God's people, you know, to the warnings that he gave through Jeremiah and actually through the other prophets as well. However, Perhaps we should be looking at this book as a uh, more of a book of love. Let, let me just read Jeremiah 7. But this thing, verse 23 to 25, but this thing command I them. This is what Jeremiah is saying. You know, what God says, obey my voice and I will be your God. And ye shall be my people. That's God's plea to his people then and us. And walk ye all in the ways I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. But as in Israel's case, and we have to be careful of ourselves, but they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and the imagination of their evil heart. And they went backward and not forward. Since the days that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, I have even sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them. We know that, that saying quite, uh, quite clearly. Um, in Jeremiah 25, we have the same words. And the Lord sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them. But the people didn't hearken. In chapter 35 and 15, I have sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them. Return now every man from his evil way and amend your doings. Now, this isn't to suggest that everybody here or others that maybe we might talk with are doing evil. But there are aspects of our life at times that we have to amend our ways. We have to look at each other to serve each other, to help each other in times of weakness, in times of error. And the reason I say that, in the last little while, I've heard of a couple brethren that have forsaken the truth. Another one hasn't fully forsaken, but also he's got some very false ideas. And I started to think, what have I done? What did I ever do to try to be in touch with that brother, to see those things coming? And then to maybe take that role of the prophet and warn that brother and help that brother in some way. The prophets were sent to help Israel. They weren't sent just to condemn Israel. God wanted them always to be helped. And each one of us might have a weakness. Even in this crisis of COVID and our isolation, um, there are many poles of the world around us. 
the Lord Jesus Christ, if we remember our foundation, called us and gave his life for us while we were yet sinners and alerted us not to fall back. So this other part of love is the looking out for each other part to help each other when there is the need to prevent one or pull one back from stumbling. Here in Jeremiah 26, it said, in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, came this word of the Lord saying, thus saith the Lord, in the court of the Lord's house, could we say the Ecclesia? Speak unto the cities of Judah, which come to worship in the Lord's house, all the words I command you and diminish not a word. If so, they will hearken every man from any evil way. God did not want to bring evil upon them. He purposed to do it, but he, that wasn't God wanted to rescue his people. He sent those prophets all the time. It says again here in 26 and uh, verse 5, whom I sent both rising early and sending them. That's what he was doing. And now where am I getting to here? He, it's a life and death matter, brothers and sisters, for all of us. And so our care for one another has to extend beyond just social niceties, I'll say, um, not just assuming everybody's okay. I found that out by dis when I discovered maybe it was too late and now trying to rescue one or two brethren. But, uh, not in, you know, maybe some know, some don't. We're not going to go into who that is right now. But it was a surprise to me. So the more we talk with each other, and it's very hard in, in these days of COVID, but you know what? How many phone calls can I make in a week? Doesn't have to be long. Might be five minutes. In that five minute phone call, what can I discover about where somebody is at in their spiritual situation? The Lord Jesus Christ knew his apostles intimately. He knew their strengths. He also knew their weaknesses. You see me once a year, maybe. <laughs> um, so, well, maybe it's a weakness <laughs> when you see me. But we don't see everything about the brother or the sister uh, that we occasionally see. Even the ones that we see when we were getting into the meeting regularly. Uh, sometimes it's, hi, how are you? That's great. Goodbye. Um, and I didn't give them a chance to answer about how they really were. It might have been an inkling that that other part of love needed to come out, that I, I need to direct them. I need to warn them. I need to counsel them, instruct them in the way better. Not just empathize with their situation, but actually do something. Jeremiah's message, when he tried to actually help the children of Israel and, and warn them, they were, they were actually in a really bad state. We know that. They wanted to kill him. That was their response. Um, so we don't... And I don't, I tend to shy away from sometimes wanting to address things that, that may be there. That I see in another brother or sister, you know, who are you to judge or things? And I'm not talking about judging, I'm talking about helping. But be aware that sometimes when we try to help or correct somebody out of love, you may not get the warm and thankful reception that you hope for. Hence, it's a hesitation we might all have for each other. And it's unfortunate that we, we don't do what we could do. You know, in Ezekiel 7, or sorry, Ezekiel 3 and verse 17, it said, Son of man, I have appointed you a watchman over the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, warn them from me. So we know what the word of God is about belief, about conduct, about all the character we need to display. And... When I say to the wicked, you will surely die, and you do not warn them or speak to warn them, the wicked from his wicked ways, that he may live, that's why you want to warn them. That wicked man will die in his iniquity, but his blood I'll require at your hand. We have a big responsibility to each other. 
that if we see something not going right with another brother or sister, that we reach out to help correct it. Yet it says, if you have <laughs> warned them, you have to pardon my dog. He's, one of them is getting a little uh, anxious here. Yet if you have warned the wicked and he does not turn from the wickedness of his wicked way, he should die in his iniquity, but you have delivered yourself. We don't do it out of selfish reasons, but we at least have done that part. And again, when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and places an obstacle before him, he will die since you haven't warned him. He shall die in his sin and his righteous deeds, which he has done will not be remembered. Think about that. What a, what a sad testimony that would be. A brother or sister who's lived a righteous life and then goes astray toward the end. And I did nothing to help them. His blood were required at my hand. But if I have warned them and the righteous man and that righteous should not sin, and he does not sin. He shall surely live because he took warning, and you have delivered yourself. What a blessing. You see this message here, when we think about it, that Christ came to save sinners. The Apostle Paul said, of whom I am chief. He'd already been in the Lord, but he understood. He, he had failings. And so we look to each other to say, if somebody's stumbling, failing, what am I doing for them? James 5 says, verse 20, my brethren, if any of you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. You know, it's, it's an amazing message, um, you know, for us that we can do that for somebody. The way the Lord Jesus saved us from our sins to the extent to where he gave his very life. As I said, while we were yet sinners, let's not forget that. And no, there's not one of us that's righteous. So we're not coming at this from an attitude of pride or boastfulness or over righteousness or anything. We'll see, but it's out of in a manner of humility and gentleness. Let, let me read uh, Jude 20, verses 20 and, and 20 to 23 from the Message Bible. Now, understand the message, if anybody uses that, is not a translation. It's a, it's a paraphrase, right? It says, but you, dear friends, carefully build yourselves up in this most holy faith by praying in the Holy Spirit staying right at center of God's love, keeping your arms open and outstretched, ready for the mercy of our master, Jesus Christ. This is the unending life, the real life. So remember, we're looking for mercy. Move on. Go easy on those who hesitate in the faith. Go after those who take the wrong way. Be tender with sinners, but not soft on sin. The sin itself stinks to high heaven. Use a little bit of vernacular there. King James says, saving others with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Proverbs 27, 5. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. It might hurt when you try to correct somebody, when you try to help them, try to pull them out of the fire. They may not want to receive it. But as we read in that other verse in Jude, we do it in gentleness. We do it with an outstretched hand to cover a multitude of sins. The Lord Jesus, you know, when he was trying to teach and instruct the apostles, you know, I, I believe I, at, uh, at Toronto East I did a talk and it was called Peter, James, and John Lessons in Humility. 
you know, and uh, that was a number of years ago. And, and I reflect upon that because there were times when those apostles who had been with the Lord, you think they would know, they'd been with the Lord. And he had set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he was going to go through Samaria, if you remember this in Luke 9. And they didn't want to receive him in Samaria. Um, you know, I, because he was going to go to Jerusalem, they, they really wanted him to stay there. So they didn't want to even come through there. And then his disciples, James and John, saw this. And you know what they said? They said, Lord, will thou command us to call fire down from heaven and consume them as Elias did? And he turned and he rebuked them. He said, I'm not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's life, but to save them. And they went on to another village. You see, we can correct somebody when they are being too harsh with their brethren, or they want to be. And we need to for their salvation. And we have to think about how we do it, in what manner we do it. Sometimes corrections needed of ourselves as well when we go too far to make it personal or judge in the sense of condemning our brother and sister. We should never be doing that. In Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2, says, Brothers and sisters, someone in your group might do something wrong. This is the message. You who are following the Spirit should go to the one who is sinning. Help make that person right again and do it in a gentle way. But be careful because you might be tempted, tempted to sin too. Help each other with your troubles. And when you do this, you are obeying the law of Christ. So you see that going to somebody who is stumbling, you are obeying the law of Christ. If you think you're in too important to do this, you're only fooling yourselves. Don't compare yourselves with others. Just look at your own work and see if you've done anything to be proud of. You must each accept the responsibilities that are yours. Now, in the New Living Translation, dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back on the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptations yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. When it talks about the law of love, this aspect of correction, of helping, is a critical, a vital part of it. You know, and it's the hardest part of it. Because what we just read there may, as I said earlier, just like the prophets, may not be well received, at least initially. It might be, and we rejoice if it is, that the righteous they are righteous, will reflect on the error or the mistake or the wrong doctrine and be corrected, be saved. Sometimes there's a need for correction or warning. It's related to behavior, conduct, morals. Sometimes it could be teaching, doctrine that needs to be corrected. But it's as much how we do it as well as to do it. In Titus 1, it said that there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. Now, those were mainly of the circumcision that were amongst them. And it said, whose mouths must be stopped. Because they were subverting whole households, teaching things they ought not. And in their case, it was for money. And we don't have that problem. That's, the, that's a motivation. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars evil be slow bellies. This witness is true, therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be found sound in the faith. Now that rebuke does not mean harshly. And I think we have to get that across. We hear the word rebuke and, and we think we're taking out the sword of the spirit and just slashing away sometimes. But that wasn't what it is, that they may be sound in the faith. We may be direct, but we can still be gentle. He had, remember, Paul had to withstand Peter to the face. It wasn't like, I'll send Peter a letter in this particular case. He actually traveled to see Peter. 
to talk to his brother directly because what Peter was doing by not fellowshipping the Gentile believers because of pressure from the, the Jewish believers was wrong. And he had, to, he had to clear the air on that. And he had to get that right with his brother for Peter's sake. It wasn't for Paul's sake. It was for Peter's sake. And, and Peter was, you know, very well respected in the, in the brotherhood. And, and Paul would look at himself saying, who am I to try to correct Peter? But he, he knew his love for Peter was so great that he, he had to do it. I don't think it was an easy task. We read those things like, oh, that was no big deal. That was a big deal for Paul because he loved Peter so much and he knew it would hurt Peter when, he, when he'd say it. In Romans 15, he says in verse 14, and I myself am also persuaded of you, brethren, that you're all full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Part of the knowledge we have is that we use it to admonish one another. We're going to come to that word admonish in a minute. Colossians 3 and 16. That the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. In psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts. Now look at that. Admonishing through hymns and psalms and songs. Admonishing means to put into mind. It's not always ex accentuating the negative, but sometimes it's, and I'm going to use the words of an old, uh, I'm dating myself, I, I wasn't alive when he, when he sang this, a Johnny Mercer, for those a little older than me, 1945 song. You might recognize the phrase, accentuate the positive and eliminate the negative. You need to latch on to the affirmative and don't mess around with Mr. In-Between. So we tell the truth. We talk about the positive aspects. Don't walk away from the goodness of the kingdom of God, things like that, an appeal. The admonishing is an appeal and hymns do that in such a great way. This one we sang in, in number 16 in the PTL, brother, sister, let me serve you. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have grace to let you be my servant too. We would serve each other. That's what it's talking about. When the word of Christ dwells in us in all wisdom, richly in all wisdom, we're able to truly help each other with their, each other's problems, problems of faith, problems of understanding. Maybe there's a, a moral pull, pull away from the things of God. Paul said in Thessalonians, and we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. See, that word, when I always read that word, I just thought it was like um, a sharp, sharp correction. That's not it. You know? It goes on in Thessalonians. Count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother when he does wrong. Remember, it's the idea of to put them in mind of what the word of God, what the truth is all about, what the hope is that we have. So when we see these words like admonish, rebuke, warn, correct, even chasten, it must be out of our genuine love and care for that brother or sister for their very salvation. So we'll say it again. Admonish is to put into mind and reprove gently. In 2 Timothy, Paul writes a lot about this because I think he saw the struggles the brothers and sisters had. But we, we come to the truth sometimes with a lot of baggage, and after we're in the truth, we have a lot of baggage. The flesh takes hold of us at times. We don't like to admit it, but it does. The well-known scripture, I'm going to read this one from the New Living Translation, just because when I read it from the King James, you finish the verse before I'm done. You'll probably finish the verse anyway. But when we hear it from a different translation, we stop and think about it a little bit more than just the memory verse that we know. 2 Timothy 3 and 16, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful 
to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Sometimes we need to show each other that word. And although I know what it says, as we referenced earlier in the, Pro in the Proverbs, faithful are the wounds of a friend. So even when I share it, it may not be well received. Look at it this way, when warning or correction comes my way, our way, I know for myself, I don't initially like it. I'll just tell you that right now. So anybody's planning to give me a call later, just <laughs> understand how it's not the thing that you want to hear. But I may not even agree that I need that correction, that instruction, that admonishing or rebuke. Nevertheless, if we let that warning or correction soak for a bit that comes our way, just maybe, I'll see what my friend, my brother, my sister was saying for my benefit and change my ways. This was the pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ. They look at in Revelation 3, the message to the Ecclesia it wasn't just to condemn them. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And he didn't just do that of himself. John 5 said, when John wrote there, he says, verily, verily, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also the son does. So he saw how the father used the prophets to correct the people. And so Jesus Follow the example of Father to correct the ecclesias in that time, to warn them, to help them. Proverbs 3 says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he corrected, even as the Father, the Son, in whom he delighteth. So, brothers and sisters, we take the Father's words. For whom the Lord loveth, he corrected. Do we love our brother and sister? Let's bring forward that godly correction where needed in a godly way, even as the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 4 said that we should not, we may learn by them not to go beyond what's written. Let's not reinterpret the Bible when we're correcting somebody. You know, we use the word as it is. We're not judging the individual. Then we've gone too far. We can be puffed up in that. And we have to give heed to ourselves. We are to use the word of God only and not our personal feelings. It's a very difficult thing detaching that. Doesn't mean we don't have some emotion involved when we are helping one another in this way, this challenging way. Brothers and sisters, one more thing. If I'm warning or correcting someone, as I said, I should not be so arrogant to think that I have perfect understanding of the scripture either or the situation that they're going through. Hence, the need for us to have humility and gentleness in our approach. This is all part of the love process in Christ. All of these examples answer the old age old question that comes back. The Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? Well, we look at that in, in a sense, he said that in a sarcastic kind of way and, you know, but for us, 19 times through the Gospels and the Epistles, we are told to love one another. Those exact words, love one another. And this is a part of love that is so hard to do sometimes. It's much easier to let something slide. But if we, if we do, brothers and sisters, if we let it slide, do we really love our brother or sister? Are we really concerned for their salvation? I thought about this exhortation, whether it's, you know, appropriate to give at this time, you know, with COVID and, and things. And 
people struggling with so many things. Um, but it is because we don't know what our brother or our sister is struggling with right now in their isolation. So that phone call to find out, how's your spiritual life? It, it's refreshing to see so many online this morning and, and coming in, as you say, from different parts of the country, maybe different parts of the world. It's encouraging and other meetings are experiencing the same. But sometimes I may be here, but I'm not. I, I, there's things going on in everybody's life. And so we need to be that loving servant of each other. And then when we talk, we find out things. And then this other part of love may have to come in. It can come in early and it's not as difficult if it comes in late. Yes, brothers and sisters, we are our brother's keeper. Our Lord gave his life out of love and obedience for every one of us. We see our brother or sister stumble by our understanding of the word. Then we in love are to watch out for each other, to speak up that they and ourselves may be saved in the great day when our Lord comes. So we're going to partake of the bread and the cup shortly. Think about his sacrifice. Think about that he gave his life to pull us out of the fire to keep us out of the fire, this remembrance. John 13 and five says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Uh, thanks, Brother Allen. A very thoughtful uh, and provoking uh, exhortation to consider that, uh, as you said, uh, brothers and sisters, let me let me serve you. We have to be introspective and in, in looking at ourselves, trying to decide just how we are going to to serve others. If we have to step into a situation, perhaps or otherwise. So that was uh, a helpful exhortation to make us think of how we are going to conduct ourselves. I thought of that passage in, uh, in Nahum where it says, he has showed thee, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with thy God. So we have to think about what Jesus did for us in, in giving his life, to think about the fact that he lived a life that we can have forgiveness of sins and then gave his life that we may, we may have the opportunity of life eternal uh, in the kingdom. So we come to the bread and wine to think about how Jesus approached that. And uh, we have asked uh, brother, uh, uh, George Carter to give thanks for the bread and brother Chris Westwood to give thanks for the wine. But Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 26, while they were eating, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take eat, this is my body. He took the cup and gave thanks and said unto them and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not uh, drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine uh, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. So we're going to listen to him 230 now. If uh, Ken, you can play that hymn for us.
So we in our own individual location in our own homes can now partake of the bread and wine and brother uh, George Carter is going to lead us in giving thanks for the bread. Brother George. Father in heaven, we humbly throw aside the throne of grace. Give praise to that great and holy name. We now remember the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior. Father, we thank thee for the bread, a symbol of our Lord's broken body. Jesus loved thee and was sinless. He gave his life for us that we may obtain the forgiveness of our sins and attain life eternal. Father, forgive us our shortfalls as we walk towards thy kingdom. We ask thee to be with us as we do so. These and all things we pray through Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can now partake of the bread. <clears throat> Brother uh, Chris Westwood is going to lead us in giving thanks for the wine. Brother Chris. Heavenly Father, in these trying times that are around us, we acknowledge that thy protective hand is always near us. And as we partake in the wine, in the memory of our Dear beloved Son, we pray that you will give us that perseverance in these troublesome times. Patience as we await thy Son's return. And Lord, keep us on that narrow way and let us not drift to the left or to the right. And now, Lord, with the wine, we'll play your strength in us by it. This we ask through Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Brother uh, Ken Curry prepared some announcements and sent them to me by email, which I'm going to uh, to read to you now. Um, I'd like to thank Alan for taking the time to uh, put an exhortation together for, for us this morning. Very thoughtful again. Um, this afternoon, 
Well, there'll be a Bible class at uh, two o'clock and Brother Allen will speak on the subject, the promise to Abraham. Well, by the way, I won't be able to preside at that. So I'm, I mentioned this to Ken. So maybe uh, uh, I mentioned that to Ken Eason. Um, I hope uh, he was able to get somebody. Um, God willing, uh, on Wednesday night at 7.30, will be an online class with uh, Brother Dan Archibald. Uh, his subject is lessons from the book of Daniel. And to preside at that uh, service on Wednesday night is uh, Ken, Ken Curry. Uh, next Sunday, God willing, the Ontario Fall Gathering that was scheduled for the next week and had to be canceled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, uh, next week, uh, the Sunday morning meeting will begin at 11 o'clock uh, to preside uh, Brother Dan Archibald and to exhort Brother Justin Keen from the Kingston, uh, Ontario Ecclesia. Um, members are asked to keep other brethren and sisters in the Ecclesia in your daily prayers. There's a, a lot of prayer needed, a, a lot of concerns with uh, individual brethren and sisters. Uh, and um, um, Paul Pierce is in uh, Mount Sinai Hospital. He was transferred to Mount Sinai the other day and um, he's in critical condition. Uh, the family have been visiting individually uh, during the last uh, week. Um, uh, the situation doesn't look particularly good. So we need uh, prayers for Paul. And uh, other activities uh, in the Ecclesial Newsletter that you can address. And uh, um, I guess one of, in our family, the, the big deal that's coming up is that uh, Julie Dawes is uh, marrying brother Adam Winfrey next uh, Saturday. So that's, uh, for our, from our standpoint, that's a pretty, well, it's a pretty big occasion. Um, so with that said, we're going to uh, close with prayer with uh, Brother Phil McKinnon, and then uh, there'll be a hymn 341. So please proceed with that, and then we'll have some discussion after. Brother Phil. Praying from the fold. Please help us to shine our lights to those around us and to follow in the footsteps of your son, Jesus. It's in his name, we offer our prayer and praise and thanksgiving. Amen. Thanks to everyone who contributed to the service and uh, Brother Ellen, hope uh, you have a good afternoon.